somehow have it. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, can I check? Mm. Uh, what is your name, by the way? I can send them in a mail only here. Uh, no, I don't, I don't, uh, what, what, what? what? Like this? Кожи. Yes. Double A. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> Maybe someone else who can provide. Huh? Uh, it's going to be a lot more. Maxim uh, by KS. M A K S. M. Uh, Maxim, okay. Maxim, what? Uh, KS. KS. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. 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 Dot Nekrashevich and E K R A S H. Yep. This? Yep. That's also. Okay. Oh. oh, yeah, you're here. So good. You can send the link I'll to the chat. Yeah, and we can start our lecture. I hope the sound will be good right now, and I hope the content also will be okay. Also, you can notice that we published a public project mm -hmm. yesterday, so you will have a chance to take a look at them. And today, we have a seminar with the seminar. Today, uh, we will say something about this particular uh, it sounds a bit strange when I look at the microphone, but I hope it's okay for you here. Okay, now, so let's start the actual content of the lecture. And today we will talk about maybe the most used, the most popular approach to do approximate Bayesian inference. Uh, in particular, we will talk about what's called variational, uh, variational inference, or can someone turn off this echo? Yeah, yeah. Someone entered the Zoom, I suppose. Yeah, right now, right now it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so uh, this approach builds on the ideas we talked about actually before. The first idea is to approximate like, this complex distribution with something similar. Uh, for example, uh, distribution of a family distribution and so on. Uh, but we will talk about a more general family of distributions to deal with. And also the second idea, the second part of this uh, method is how we select what is close and what is not close in terms of uh, two distributions. And we will basically use the full of average version. So it's kind of resembles what we have done when we talked about this, you know, the, this Gauss or full of is the name for it. Similar. It was like previous week when we tried to use a Gaussian distribution or a mixture of Gaussian distribution to match initial distribution. And we minimize the equivalent. So, okay. Why do we need it? Okay. No, it doesn't work. Oh, please.
Okay, very good. So we will start with some applications related to why do we need approximate basic inference. Then we go to the approaches. So let's start with the introduction on what kind of problems require this approximate basic inference. And we will talk a bit about why we can't do without this basic. So let's make a general scheme on what we are doing when we are doing machine learning or statistics or like basic uh, Basically, we have some assumptions about what model do we have. This is an example of assumption, some kind of graphical model to do this. Also, we have for sure some data and we want to some discuss some patterns in this data and we discuss the patterns given this assumption. In this case, we kind of learn the model with the data, discover some patterns, and in the end, we are able with this estimated model to predict something or to report something or whatever. <clears throat> so this kind of scheme is quite general. It is in applied fields, in like mathematical backgrounds, and so on. So uh, what's important about it is that it separates uh, our whole process of model into three stages. The first stage is about the definition of the probability model. The second stage is about how we estimate the parameters using the data, or maybe update our knowledge about the dots using the data. And then we use this constructed model to say something about the dot about the data. Okay, so what's the problem here? What we typically do this when we are talking about based on inference? Actually, most of the time, the most complex, the most crucial step we want to make, but we can make in an exact form, is the inference. In this case, it's somehow connected to this guy and to this guy. In this guy, the inference is related to estimation of the likelihood. So we want to maximize the likelihood, we should somehow uh, write it down and uh, find a solution for the optimization problem or to book posterior probability. In this case, again, deal with some complex, maybe a non analytical form of posterior distribution, and we should somehow do it. Also, the inference can be a key problem not only at this stage, but at the third stage when we are trying to predict something and we create, for example, the prediction given that we both deal with it. Uh, from basic point of view and want to calculate an integral something like, like this. Yeah. In this case, we have a problem that in this problem this integral, which we want to calculate given the data. Sometimes it's not analytical, and we want to somehow. Uh, just with it to have nice tractable solution. Okay. So, mm, 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 okay. Doesn't matter much. It also doesn't matter much. Uh, let's uh, like have another deduction notation. It would be also quite fast, I hope, because we already discussed it a lot. Basically, we have some probability for x, some condition probability for x given some parameters theta, base and formula. And evidence is the bottom of the formula, which has the following form, or you can decompose this guy into the product of likelihood and parameters. Okay, nice and clear, nice and clear. Uh, Basically, we can say something similar not only about data, about particular set of parameters, but also about uh, the model itself. We can say, suppose we have an like, uh oh, it's not, not about this. But basically, it's the same thing to the previous slide, but with data instead of like general generic random one approximation. Okay, 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 okay. For prediction at this integral, we already have a whiteboard. And so, so, what you want to do when we are doing basic difference, given this definition of decomposition steps, is to try to place the posterior. And give the posterior try to raise that distribution, which has the following form the general we want to take, but we can't do in many cases. Also, there are many related problems for this kind of inference that uh, take similar form, 
uh, but along some different limitations. For example, we can try to compare not parameters, but models, for example, have two models, and we want to identify what models is the best. For example, we have two set of possible predictors and we want to identify which set is better. It can be the case, for example, when we again go back to linear regression and for linear regression, we want to select how the degree of the polynomial of each is generated. This is kind of not very like practical example because I think nowadays not many of you in a research sector trying to do something. Okay, let's try to compare this kind of model with this kind of model. We okay, have not x1 and x2, but also x1, x2 x1 squared, x2 squared, and so on, and so on. But like, it's uh, considered in many practical papers, and you can imagine something similar in for your problem statement, when you try to trade off complexity of the model and a certain power, how well this model explains the data you have. And there is often a trade-off because you have Enough features typically we can approximate everything, like a simple server about networks, for example, or for polynomials, I suppose we can do something similar. Uh, but basically, when we have two complex model, then we have not very good performance because of the overfitting and we want to deal with it somehow. So basically, we want to select the best model, and from Bayesian point of view, it's equivalent to are dealing with the evidence to compare the evidence of different types of models, as you can see. Yeah, and then basically we can try to compare these evidences given the model and say that if evidence is greater, then the model is more suitable for this particular task. And we again do this very complex integral here. Again, we need to create it like this, and it's common to like the classical integration of the evidence problem. We should somehow uh, take this integral, but we typically take this integral. And so one of the way to do this is based on inference. This is the graph very dimensional. Uh, again, we state that for computing the distributions, we have to deal with some untractable thing and so on. And so like this was a very general introduction. But also, let's look at some specific examples when these types of problems come into the play. Yeah. What is marginal like this? Uh, marginal no, like it. No. I think it's uh, in these terms is uh, uh, in this case it can be decomposed like this. So it's like the of the model given the data. Also, we can say that marginal like it is. The likelihood then we have additional, some additional assumptions. Uh, what do you mean by model some prior uh, assumption about the situation of that? Uh, about the models, I will describe it actually when he was out there, but let's repeat my model. For example, you can say, okay, the model one is one, two features, x1 and x2. My M2 is model when we have a linear regression and our features are x1, x2, x1 times x2, x1 squared, x2 squared, and so on. Like we have mk is the model of this linear regression assumption and with all features generated from the basic features with a polynomial degree up to k. Okay. okay? What then uh, distribution E uh, theta given model? Ah, uh, here. Well, the second term. Uh, the... Yes. Oh, basically, we can say in this case is just prior. Mm -hmm. Okay, we define a separate prior for each one, one, two, three. For example, we can like try to impose some zero mean and unit variance or single spirit variance prior. For and assume that there is an ID assumption for our parameters. So it's basically how we define the prior, given that we somehow identify the model for it. Okay, okay. Or maybe we can go deeper. No? Okay. Let's go on. 
So we define this kind of problems and we are worried about how can we solve it. And we started with like, very general doubts about uh, these models. And I think that you kind of hear this kind of doubts during the course before, and maybe here after the course or during the course later. But basically, let's consider uh, three problems related to this particular interpretability issue that we want to deal with during this lecture and actually during the most part of the course. Actually, we have like a couple of, of three or four lectures to work to different approaches to deal with it. Okay. Uh, do you know what the systematic factorization is? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Can you rise against it? Okay. And rise your hand is that the first time you are trying to construct a recommender system based on the basis of factorization. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thanks. And uh, for others. The question is how we reconstructed the. Uh, yes, yes. So what is uh, matrix factorization related to recommendation systems? Uh, maybe you can explain what do you think about this approach and how it works. So let's write some mass here. Yeah, what are the objects we do this? So we have matrix R. This is a matrix of interactions between users and some kind of objects, for example, modules, and each element of this matrix is the rating of this movie given by this particular reason. Yeah? Okay, so we have it like this. If we have this full matrix, where I is index related to user, J is some movie, for example, and we have some ratings in this case. Okay. And how can, what, how do we approach this problem when we try to predict uh, uh, a rating of a new movie by some reason? Mm -hmm. So we have this model like this here. Yeah? And how? Is a product of UI and rating. And we should have that's boss. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. And uh, how we obtain the centers? So if you want to predict something, we should obtain somehow the vectors related to users and the vectors related to models. Can someone give an answer here? Yeah. We can just optimize some, some metric. What metric? Like uh, thermos. Yeah. So we can say something like, okay, we have actual uh, for some players of models and users here. Yeah. So, and we want to say that this guy should be small, given the AMG belongs to the Set of all possible pairs we have run. So, yeah, why suppose it's like this? That's how I can remember. Okay, so we directly optimize this vector and it is like an easy problem from, from the optimization point of view. Why? Why is this problem not so not hard? Can we solve it like analytically? <laughs> Uh, yes, it's a differentiable problem. That's okay. A lot of problems of this. Uh, we can say something even more about it. Yes, that's exactly. Yeah. And even more, it's like a quadratic problem, actually. Yeah? 
because the dependence of this guy is linear on the components. And here you can think it's for that with respect to either user. Yes, yes, of the representation of user samples. Yeah, but, but not the, the whole set of the variables. Uh, what are the variables? Like you, I, I uh, what, what, what? Like, my, my matrix is you and you. Can you elaborate a bit? So you have this vectors. This is basically what uh, is a very basic version of classification. This is what we have. Yeah, yeah. We have uh, features for users, features for movies. Yeah, so it's quadratic under the, 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 the brackets, and then it gets squared. So it's like the first degree. Mm. It's quadratic with respect to each of the parameter. Yes, but we need to optimize them jointly. Mm, yes, yes, I agree, yeah, but it's still not, not in like very most. I agree, yeah. this is the case. So basically, we try to decompose to provide embeddings for users and embeddings for models. And uh, so uh, we are doing this using this kind of loss function related to the actual ranking we have. And nothing we can produce with these features, this feature user, this feature for mobile. And basically, a problem I solve it in many applications, in many cases. And we can predict actually rankings, ratings in a very simple. Okay. So let's try to make this problem probabilistic. So we will be able to add some Bayesian spirit to it. And so what we are saying. We say that actual this ranking is a Gaussian random variable with some mean and some values. For me, when we just take this color product of U and U. And we have some balance, which we don't specify how we estimate. Uh, but don't we have a string that R V G this should be integer? Yes. No, typically when we uh, doing things like this, you don't have this constraint. So even if your example will change to the slide, because what are the predictions? Yeah, okay. Actually, the integer predictions is poor, actually. Because, okay, we want to rank all the movies, yeah? For a particular reason. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's the goal of the reputation system. We have the user comes to you and he wants the best movie or the best five movies. The most relevant to him. So basically, it would be very bad idea to have like only discrete predictions because if we if you have a lot of movies with the ranking, uh, the top ranking, for example, five, I don't know, five or five, and uh, instead it would be much more convenient to have rankings that is like live in continuous space, so you have clear ranking without any ties around this ranking. So you have definitely like, the top movie with the top similarity between user and this movie and so on. So basically, if you observe this as something discrete, most of the time, it can even be either zero one, if user likes or does, doesn't like a particular movie, as like, for example, for YouTube, you have like, not many options to say something, to say ranking actually. Uh, but basically, when you predict the samples, it's much easier and much more interesting to think about it as a continuous value. Okay. Okay, so basically we have samples like this, and also as again we that we have some prior of the ranges. So for example, we can say that we have some mean values for vectors for users and some Variables for the vector of is a different. Okay, so <clears throat> we can say that we have everything again is Gaussian, and we expect that this kind of product would be in a way reasonable. Uh, and also, we add some additional conjugate products for the parameters uh, as for the hyperparameters of the. So there are our models, we can on top uh, observations related to this latent vectors of rankings for users and for models. 
then as the next step, we define priors for users and for Mobis representations. And at the last step, we define that we have another priors, not an investigation priors for our hyperparameters. Touch you, if touch you. Okay, so in that we have this three level hierarchy, two level hierarchy. Okay. So the graphical model is like this, with this alpha star hyperparameters for the parameters of the prior related to the random vectors or uh, objects. And we have observations. You can see that it's colored with gray color that we actually observe. And we have um, users and objects, and also we have additional sigma. We don't impose any priorities. This is a small level. Okay. So uh, what we actually want to do if we have all the parameters estimated, we say that our distribution or our AG estimated from data is like this. Yeah, you say that. Okay, this first level, second level, third level. Yeah, only one two levels. So. Uh, given that we have some estimation of every parameters and on the units. And so, if you look at this scene closer and you try to do some calculations and try to take this integral, you will fail. Just because it's against this integral, this is And again, this posterior distribution will be complicated. No close point. So, Need approximate. Yeah. Uh, you and uh, the idiot are they um, estimated to or they do not? Uh, can you repeat what, what you are talking about? That are you, that are you with? Uh, yeah, the, the first uh, E in uh, integral. Um, with, with, yes, here. Do this guy. We do not have them estimate them. Yeah, we we estimate this is new and actually we estimate that distribution. Uh, and uh, isn't uh, isn't this multiplier is just one because uh, R I J the star is uh, exactly scalar product of those two. Mm, we actually we should be both the previous right? We say that actually it's not a scalar product. It's a random variable like this, which is the mean value that equals to this scalar product here. Yeah. But also we have some variance, some variance. So basically it's not as simple if we are talking about the base. Okay. Okay. Is the common right? about why is it uh, so complicated because uh, when you choose only Gaussians as far as conditions, and why the code is also Gaussian, and why they do not control Okay, so we have one Gaussian and another Gaussian, and we have scalar product of two Gaussian. What's the distribution of scalar product of two Gaussian? We don't know yet. Yeah? If you have two simple Gaussian variables, we have squared Gaussian variable, we have something like T squared. But if you are dealing with something more complex, multidimensional, I suppose there is no good loss of solution in this case. So in this in this scenario, due to we have this product here and something more complex, it's impossible to uh, calculate and let it correct. Okay. So, some new topics, unfortunately. Uh, let's deal with a different mass model, which we all care about, about some kind of neural networks. Okay, so we start with some kind of regression problem. X are observations, Y is our targets for these observations. 
and we can say that our magnitude is famous. Yeah, so it's like a uh, usual regression is Gaussian noise, uh, which is the variance defined by beta in minus one power. And uh, we have also this guy here. In linear regression, we just have a scalar product of x and w. Uh, but if we deal with, for example, simple fully connected neural network with some nonlinearity, for example, sigma function, then this guy is more complex here, as yes, you can see. So this is not actually the power, it's the second layer and the first layer parameters. Is the formula for f is clear? Yeah, yeah, we have two layers. The first input layer and the second not input layer, output layer. And we have some linearity connected to the into how we go from one to the first layer to the second layer. And so we have this usual fully connected element. Yeah. What does in this case? Okay, here. The second. Mm -hmm. I suppose it's related to a particular output here. If the if a one dimensional output, we can say that okay, we can drop the I think it's also like somehow related to uh, usually we think about neural networks or something used to solve classification problem. And in this case we have k classes. And so we have this range of different cases here. Maybe it would be easier to just draw it. Okay. So we have this uh, probabilistic model. And so we want to have some biases in over it. So we have some graph. Similar to what we did before, we produce a simplest prior possible. It says each parameter of this fully connected neural network has zero link and some variance. They are ID variables. And so we can write again the bias formula, but it does not help much because, again, our posterior would be intractable because of this complex connection between. Y and inputs and parameters, no linear way you can see, definitely not something you can compute analytically. We can talk actually a lot about different types of models, that's not very good. When we think about them in this way. Ah, but do you know how to minimize this? Eh? There should be one high. No, not this one. The height was first in the first one. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, good. Mm, I don't know. Maybe, maybe if you have time, then you can test this model. Okay. Let's skip this third example. You can try to do it at home, or maybe if you have time, then for the lecture, you'll have it. Uh, but basically, we see that there is a lot of examples related to some. Important problems in machine learning that produce, as a result, some intractable posteriors, but we still want to do some predictions and some prediction for or predictions and some estimation, for example, for maximum posteriors. Uh, so, what, how, the, are there any recipes, more or less universal, that we can propose in this case? And uh, let's think about it like, from the very general point of view, what we want and what we can get. Uh, we can say, okay, we have this distribution. 
p of z given x. It's very hard. We can't tell it to the computer. It's something what we have in this in many other Bayesian models, and it's not no Bayesian. Okay, but we have a family of good distributions. Before last approximation, this family of good distributions was a family of Gaussian distributions. This is the distributions Q capital. So we want to find the best distribution in this family, the closest one to actual distribution here. Uh, and uh, for example, we can say that our distribution should be close in terms of, for example, to the clever divergence to the actual distribution. As we already know, there were some tricks to calculate this uh, clever divergence, even in the case that we don't know the implementation constant. And also, typically, when we have this kind of problem statement, we parameterize the distribution. So we just don't consider like a generic family of distributions, for example, all small distributions, all distributions with slight differentiable density, but rather we try to limit ourselves to some convenient family of distributions, for example, Gaussian distributions. So we can say that each Q is parameterized by theta, and we minimize through the gradual divergence between. Q Z theta and P Z U and X with respect to theta to find theta star to the best values here. And later we will talk into the details on what are the most interesting, the most useful types of particular implementation of this idea. So it's quite general idea actually. There are a lot of things to try, for example, there is expectation propagation and so many others that are related to different types of minimization that we can try to minimize not through a pattern of Q given P, but instead try to minimize through the pattern of P given Q, and we will have the solution in the form of, for example, expectation propagation. Uh, but in this case, the, the general name for it is variation inference. And so what we want from it and what we will get in a couple of minutes is we want this guy to scale to massive data. Also, we want to go for main difficult models. So we don't want to invest something new for each type of model because there would be already new models, new type of architectures. For example, if you talk about neural networks, it would be said that you want to redo all the basic things for an architecture or something that works. Quite good for my scenarios. Also, the last point is maybe we want to change the family of U and still get some new. Okay. And uh, we'll consider today mean field variation inference and maybe stochastic variation. In this case, we again revisit variational lower bound and from this we will be a uh, classical mill scheme operational inference. Then uh, we will talk a bit about how SVD approaches are related to variation inference. And if we have time, we will consider two particular applications, variational transponder for the model images, and how can we do this multidimensional series prediction uh, using this paradigm. Okay, so let's introduce some very generic type of model. We want to approximate our initial distributions. We say that we have some z, some x, x is something we observe. Z is some latent variable related to each object. For example, it can be cluster level or maybe like some class level here. Yeah. Also, we have some global parameters of the distribution. We can think about it, for example, as parameters of this clusters. Okay. So in this case, typically we can decompose our joint distribution of beta parameters and Z local uh, latent parameters and X observations into this form. We say that our Z X observations are ID. So our joint distribution is a product of this prime for beta 
and uh, densities given by. Okay, so S of so X and dot of self beta and Z. We want to get the distribution of beta and Z given X. And this would be our problem that we want to solve is this variation in transparent. Okay, yeah, do we finish some time? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's more common to say to think about them as unlike variables, for example, plus and minus. For example, you have x points and some clusters like each of them. Okay, x cluster level of each point, and we don't know them before. And we want to estimate them, and we have what to draw to estimate uh, like parameters of the clusters. Uh, did you have expectation optimization of this? So basically, it's just like and variables in this form state. Beta, I suppose, uh, if you're talking about Gaussian Beta, is the parameters of class. So it's mean value for each class and variance for each class. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. I familiar with Gaussian Beta. Mm -hmm. So it's basically like a group version of Camus. In Camus, you have fixed variance, it's similar variance for all clusters. And just make means for Gaussian sure, which models you on three uh, variances and just make joint variances and mean various questions. Okay, so let's <laughs> revisit one more time. Expectation lower bound or evidence variation lower bound. Okay, I don't know, I think it's like fifth or six times since the course here. Yeah. Yeah. So we again deal with full vocabulary version of the QRP. Again, write it down and decompose into two terms. The first term is something that doesn't relate actually to Q is related only to this PD and the integral that's practically gives plus one this star. And uh, for the second term we put everything else and we have this ratio of P divided by Q here when P is something we can compute. And even if you don't know the validation cost of you the validation cost of all those logarithms, again, with respect to Q, right? it's always something that we don't care. Okay, again, as this group of divergence is greater than equal to zero, we say that uh, our difference is greater or equal to zero. And so we can say that we can move L1 to the right hand side here. And say that our logarithms of PG is greater or equal to this variance lower bound reduced by this integral. And so, if you maximize Q, maximize this elbow with respect to some family Qs from Q capital, we get a better lower bound as we have wider and wider Qs here. But again, we can pretty good approximate even for not very bad factors. Any questions about this slide? It's everything here. Okay. So the question for to define this procedure for consultation is how we define this family for distribution scheme. We can say that. Mills yield variation bias actually is a family distribution which can be decomposed in the following way. So it's just factorization of this distribution. Actually, right here, uh, we even don't assume that this skews are normal and so on. We can start with very generic assumption that we decompose your 
do you share every surprise for this person? No, okay. Uh, typically, we also can have additional restrictions. For example, you can say that each QJ is from some national family, but it's not necessary in many cases. We just use this factorization, and sometimes the derivations for this factorized distribution simplifies, and we can do it even in quite complex cases. Okay. So basically, uh, we just uh, decompose this uh, Q to factors, and we will get mean field variation that we have still doesn't mean anything actually. It's some term from I suppose physical physics for the exists of 60s, and it was invented there, and then it was transferred to machine learning. Set here. Uh, also, you can see that in many cases you get pretty good estimation here. Uh, and for example, we have this example stereo, and we have this uh, mean field variation by estimation. Uh, we can say that uh, it's quite easy to think about some approach to deal with finding this particular theorem. And so we will consider now, or maybe a bit later, the main approach. The main idea of this approach is to maximize this roller bound step by step by selecting a particular view from the set QJ to maximize at this step, given that all other queues will be fixed. <coughs> so again, we like get down to this idea by uh, fixing the following assumptions. We say that we have some Q start approximate our distribution P. Then, as the next step, we say that we want to find Q start by maximizing some kind of divergence between posterior distribution and Q. In this case, we have this phi, F. And if we specify particular divergence, particular equivalent divergence, and this F, we get variation of bias. And if you say that we have this factorization assumption for Q, you get mid bias, it will be so the hierarchy, and there is a lot of approaches at each level of this hierarchy, uh, but this one is one of the most successful. So we can see And we will try to cover some approaches that deal with this means of iteration bias, and I hope you have some clear. So let's go. Any questions? There was on one of the previous slide, the usual uh, building is not modern consumption. Bold, bold font? Bold. Yeah. Yeah. It does not mean that we actually don't, uh, don't overfit here. It means that if we, okay, you can say something uh, like, okay, we have this optimization problem, and does we overfit, uh, do we overfit if we introduce more and more complex distributions. And actually here, if we have this exact estimation of full of every divergence, we just don't care about it. Because this is not like the family of models uh, in a probabilistic sense. It's a family of models in this space for distributions. So there is no chance to overfeed, uh, at least in traditional sense. So it means it's not the modern assumption. And also another uh, note here that we don't assume any particular form of QJ. We so say it can be any distribution. We just assume that it's a factorization of the whole distribution to the points. So in this census, we say that there is no OK. OK, so uh, let's try to see something about it. So, okay, this is what we have. Now, let's write down the variation of the bound. It's like this, yeah? So, we just decompose the logarithm into the product of two terms and split the uh, assuming sum of two terms. The first sum determines the sum here, the second sum. 
Yeah, this one one is something like that. Entropy, the first one is more complex. Okay, but you know that IOQ has the following form. So let's put this form into this integral. And we have the two parts of this integral. The first part is related to a particular QJ, and everything else doesn't relate to this QJ. Created without QJ, or integrals in size, like the multidimensional integral, and you put everything but this J is component inside this variables. Okay? We have this class term. We say that IOQ has a following form. So we put here this is guy and all other guys are here. And everything else, so this guy doesn't depend on the cubic at all. So we can write down in this form. Uh, we can do something similar with the second term. We say that, okay, let's uh, put uh, the definition of Q here. And we will have something like this. And something like this. Can someone explain why we might be like this? Is it clear or not? I mean, just presenting the queue as a uh, product of Jupyter and then just fitting. Why do we why do have some here? What was the problem? Mm. Mm, well, basically, yes. So you say, let's put instead of queue the product of queues and have uh, this logarithm product, product as sum of logarithms. Then we have that uh, for each particular Q, we have uh, the just QJ if it's no logarithms and uh, uh, one term is related to particular Q. So we say that it is like okay. This is our formula is like product Q J to J respect to J and sum of logarithms of one divided by Q J to J one to J. So let's consider one chart here. And we have here the product of uh, okay, the marker is not good, but can you see? Okay, so I put a product of qj to j and sum one divided by logarithms of one divided by q. Okay, and and so we can marginalize here everything but the one term. And so we integrate out everything but one, and we have this marginal distribution Q at the trade logarithms of oh, sorry, at the K logarithms of one divided by that term K at the K. The K at the K. And we do the same thing for all terms. And in the end, we have something that is related to QJ and everything else. Okay. No, okay, it's pretty easy to see that how we define this guy even must. Integrate with respect to all Qs, expect Uj at the Js. Okay, so we have this decomposition. 
when we try to separate terms and depend on QJ and doesn't depend on QJ. And so, why do we do it? We actually want to fix all Qs except one and maximize our elbow with respect to this remaining component, QJ to QJ. And so, let's introduce Q with a wave theta j defined by this expectation we had before. As it is, as you can see from this formula, it's an expectation with respect to all i not j that doesn't equal to j. Uh, then we will have some dependence on theta j in the end. And we can say this kind of distribution here, which we call q with a wave theta j. Or like you can try to represent it in different way, just take the exponential of these ones. We doesn't care about constant, sure, because okay, just normalization constant, because we want to have a distribution in the end. Also, as we are still in the lot of program and divergences, we actually when we maximize something with respect to Q, we don't care about normalization constants. So we say that actually what we are trying to solve the problem in the previous slide actually has the following form. The first term we just put Q instead of uh, this expectation here. And the second term is like this from the derivations we have on the white wall. So we have this representation, this form of the variation of a bond. Which we emphasize the parts related to QJ here. And this guy is actually something we know a lot about, actually. It's a curve of divergence of Q and Q with a wave. Yeah. Do you agree? Because okay, if I just QJ theta J, log of the ratio of Q wave divided by QJ. So as you know, to get zero correct average divergence, we should uh, put Q greater equal to Q with a wave theta J. Yeah. Okay. Because correct average divergence can be smaller than zero, and the only case zero. If you have this point. Okay. So we have the exact formula for the estimation of QJ star, even all other Qs. It like this. Because we have this form here. So if we know all the terms except one, we can calculate this. And so now, from this observation, we can get a practical approach to find the actual distribution for QJ, QQ. So we start with some initialization of factors QI, and then one by one, we reestimate them using these formulas. We find these expectations, if you can find them for sure, and we get an base for Q that I and then we hope that we will get into the convergence. And uh, it's like uh, quite natural that we will converge with someone because actually we are solving quite well defined transition problem. You maximize this elbow, this evidence of our bound. And for sure, we can get better than actual value for evidence. And we will stop at some point. But at each iteration, we try to improve this bound to make it more tight, more closer to the actual evidence. OK, well, let's look at the example of how can we apply this kind of approach for a particular problem. It's a bit simpler than what we considered in the beginning of the lecture. But OK, okay we have this strange mission, a type of fly, actually. And we have link lengths for each of it, and we have a sample of this length in millimeters. We also know that we have a general population, and for the general population, we have some mean and the balance. And so 
you can say that our mean variance you want to estimate are obtained from this one here. Yeah. That's Gaussian distribution for our observations. So each xi is from the Gaussian distribution, it's given the mean variance, and so on. Also, we have some priorities here. Yeah. The first priority is for mu, it's like this, so mu zero, and so on. Like and we also have some priority for the inverse variance. It's just a common distribution. So okay, the most convenient way to think about priors for variance. I think you already see some things like this when we are talking about basic linear regression. Here we have like the simplest possible way to do something linear. We basically have the constant mean value. Okay, yeah. Okay, let's apply our variation approximation here. Our assumption, okay, we have basically two parameters here. Mu and char we want to estimate. And so we use this factorization. We say our Q is a product of the distributions related to mu and to chow. So this is basically the straightforward way to make field variation. Okay, so what we get? We have this formula for estimation. We want to calculate first to be able to write down this approximate inference function. So we write down this formula here. And as everything here is something close to Gaussian or to normal distributions, we know a lot about. Uh, we can say that if we have some mean value for tau, then our Q star for mu is like this. So a fixed distribution Q tau and get Q mu star in the form of this logic. Right. As you can see, it's a Gaussian distribution actually because it is the logarithms of it has a square dependence on mu here. And so we can say that our Q mu mu at the next iteration is like this with the following estimation. The mean value is basically has quite a single form. This is guys from prior, this guy from the posterior, and for variance it's slightly more complex because it does depend on the mean value of tau as a particular moment. So we need this Q tau to get this estimation uh, mean value of tau. Any questions about the slide? Oh, okay. Now let's move to the second step. And right now we want to do something like this, but for, for, for tau, as we know from the theorem, we derived a couple of sites before. We we'll write down the formulas for this optimal Q tau star here. And actually it's sum of these two guys here and another guy. Yeah, let's compare it to the formulas we have. So we say that we need something like this. And this is expectation with respect to mu of this uh, joint distribution here. Yeah? It's a product of flat and flat. And basically, what we need. Yeah? Why is there an extra term outside of the expectation? Uh, this term outside the expectation. Uh, let's see. So we have <clears throat> this guy here, joint distribution of D and theta is actually a product of likelihood and prior. Prior is a product of prior for one parameter and prior for another parameter. Uh, for the parameter tau, we can integrate out everything, and we are left with logarithms of uh, the prior density for tau. For everything else, we have as this integral that decides the expectation. Okay? Well, we didn't have it on the previous 
because the, the prior of uh, Actually, let's see. Let's, let's see by the back there. Which... Because prior always mm. on power. Uh, actually, we have, yeah, we have the same similar term, but it, we can get it out of the integral. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a bit simple. And so, yeah, suppose we, we don't miss anything here. Yeah. Okay, again, some technical work to do. But then we have this first term related to mu, and the second term related to this gamma distribution for tau. Yeah, this is another part. So we can now write down the solution for our problem for estimation of the tau. It is has the following form. It's again in the gamma distribution because of what we introduced before. And actually pay attention that we actually doesn't specify any form for this fields, for these factors of the distribution Q. We derive them from like these formulas. We integrated and see that this distribution is actually gamma distribution. It was the same for the previous. Well, the previous distribution estimated, we actually integrated and see, okay, it's actually Gaussian distribution. It doesn't, we don't make any assumption, but in the end, we have this Gaussian form here. And again, for tau, we also have another like tactical distribution gamma distribution. Is this parameters obtained from? This one. Okay, so we're now able to uh, run the algorithm, the variation difference with this twice model for the length of the slice. And we can see what's going on when we proceed with the estimation. We initialize this blue distribution in the top left corner here, and actual distribution is this green one, and we start with changing the distribution with respect to mu. And we have this second uh, estimation. This is like top right figure here. Then we go to the third step, estimate with respect to tau, and so on and so on. We get some like this. As you can see, we quite close to the actual distribution. As a second step, it's like, OK. It's uh, partly because we have quite a simple problem here. Nice and too complex, uh, partly because this method is bad. So, this is a result of our application. So, that's basically the end for what the variation inference is and what is mean to the variation inference. Maybe later we we'll consider a bit different settings for approximate inference. But this is very basic thing, and it happens a lot when we are doing approximate based inference. We are often doing something like this. As you can see, it's like there was some difficulty with that we want to estimate fundamentals like this. We want to get these integrals and still want them to be analytically factorable. And uh, it's sometimes the case. And uh, it requires some additional attention, but basically we can try to do something simpler if we want to get results fast. Actually, we can draw one step here, 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 and say that we want to somehow replace this exact formula with something approximate that we can use this, for example, and do some kind of addition. When we understand and so this fast variation difference, uh, when, for example, assume that this use are uh, again of distribution. Oh, and, and so something similar in, in different variations. We have some time for application. And then, so let's look at each one of them. Another application, very important and very popular before. Mm, before introduction of deep models for natural processing. And the idea is the following. We have a very large corpus of texts and a large collection of libraries. 
and we assume that each document is somehow related to some set of topics. And actually, it's like the result of generating models conditioned on the set of topics related to this document. And so our idea is to identify these topics. Often, and in our case, it will be an supervised approach to this kind of problem. Ah, okay, can you raise your hand if you did or know what is the component? No. Do you know the model as a model related to it? And anyone else? Okay. So basically, it's actually another model that can be described in by yes and by. So we expect that if you have some generic words in the document and some words generated by this particular product. You can see some example here. In this case, you can say that it's some uh, red topic, yellow topic, and uh, green topic. Yellow topic explains some genomes, so sequences of genomes, genetic, and so on. Uh, red topic connected to some life or general biology. And also, we have some topics related to this green part, some like predictions, models. And so, what we assume, more, more formally, we say that each topic introduces some kind of distribution of a box. What kind of words you can encounter if you have a text of this topic? For example, for the yellow topic, we have the gen, DNA, genetic, and so on, something which is very common in this type of things. For the blue topic, we have something connected to data, computer the science and so on. So each document actually is a mixture of topics. And we can assume that to generate each new word from this topic, you, from this text, as I sorry, uh, we have, we take it from this back related to this. So the problem is that we observe only the documents. We don't know the topics beforehand, which somehow infer them. They are hidden in the sense that they are legend variables. So basically, we have this Bayesian way to think about it. We said that we have some documents, and given the document, we want to get the procedure of topics, proportions, or assignments. In this case, we have like millions of documents, millions of variables, and so this kind of big data, large scale problem, but we still want to get it. So we try to have this kind of model representation as a graphical model. We have these observations, actually, as this observed here. We have for each word the topic related to each word. For the first word is genetic, for the second word is biology, for the third word is computer science. Uh, then we have this more general description of the document that describes what kind of topics are in the document. Also, we have parameters related to topics and maybe some prior param parameters related to priors. So this, this kind of model, we can try to do some kind of factorizations, and also we can try to define the constitution to the joint distribution. And what we can think about this right now. We again write some formula for the posterior of all these variables. So these guys are latent variables for jobs. These guys are latent variables for documents. And these guys are somehow related to the description of the topics. What kind of jobs are common for each particular topic? So if you have this posterior distribution, we can say this. Okay, let's write on guys' formula. It's like this. For the joint distribution and for the evidence we want. Okay. And for sure, we can compute something in the right side and even, I suppose, in the top two because of too many uh, possible combinations here. So we should use approximate inference. And if you apply it in the right way, like we did before today via. In variation inference, you can see some results here. For example, 
you can say what kind of topics you can find on your articles. And definitely there is some topic related to baseball, I suppose, topic number one. Uh, topic number two, I don't know, some very general things about life. Topic number three is about movies and films and so on. Topic number four, about book. And so, so we see that uh, we can identify actually quite relevant, quite interesting topics. And they're distinct from each other and they really describe the part of our life described in the article of New York Times. So basically, if we apply variation inference in this way, we still can get something meaningful, something that can lead to quite interesting uh, ideas about what kind of things we have in our lives. Uh, in the seminar, I think you continue to work with variation inference, maybe consider some examples. But you for sure will know like in 10, 15 minutes. I am all for today. Thank you for your attention and have a nice day and a nice day afterwards. Goodbye. Thank you. Yeah. Ну, как бы современная система, реклама система, это очень сложная штука. То есть, да, то есть там, если говорить про продажи, там очень много всего накручено, то есть там есть, конечно, базовое правило. То, собственно, много проблем, с которыми нужно бороться, с которыми маточная капитализация, как бы, если бороться. То есть, если, например, там проблема холодного старта, когда у нас просто нет информации, потому что дети, в этом случае можно, например, взять фичи клиента, и попробовать по ним уже представить, какие есть вопросы, какие нет. Решить какую-то такую более методическую задачу регрессии. А что еще там можно пробовать делать? Что нужно делать? Ну, нужно, как бы, часто у нас просто нет такие системы, те, которые нам и всем прямолинейны. Это предсказание рейтинга, которые будут на правильные, которые уже успел смотреть. На самом деле это не очень хорошая штука. Что... Ну, нам, на самом деле, нужно предсказывать ранжирование. Нам нужно все задачу ранжирования, а не задачу регрессии. И поэтому там тоже некоторые нюансы о том, как рекомендовать. Кроме того, у нас могут быть дополнительные методы с точки зрения бизнеса, например, мы хотим рекомендовать более диверс. То есть есть такой эффект Гарри Поттера о том, что диверс не в том смысле, в котором обычно это знаете, сейчас, да? а, а скорее то, что как бы не хотите все время рекомендовать Гарри Поттера и вот на колец, рекомендовать какие-то более интересные, более узкие фильмы. И опять же, тут связано, связано например, с тем, что у нас будет мало данных, для фильмов, которые мы рекомендуем речь. Ну, то есть это большая область, которая... Я могу там за три минуты рассказать, но, наверное, стоит поговорить более.